Hey, welcome to my kitchen, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I've got a really big deal for you today. I'm gonna make mole with you, but I'm gonna make mole what I call the beginner's mole. Now this isn't, if you've seen a recipe that I've done before that's called the, the peanut mole, that's more like a pepion and super, super simple and very delicious, I have to say. I turn to that recipe all the time. But if you wanna really tackle an honest mole, like the classic mole poblano with three different dried chilies in it and so forth, well, you know, you really have to go through certain steps but I've sort of truncated some of those steps to make it really easy. So if you've always been intimidated by making a real mole, I'm gonna make a small batch with you. That's one of the big things, because usually people make mole in huge, huge batches. So I'm gonna make a small batch that honest to goodness, you can tackle, anyone can tackle. So let's talk about the ingredients first, okay? So we have three different dried chilies here. So we have, uh, this is an, a mulatto chili, and this is the ancho chili. Now, they look kind of different in size, but lots of times they look almost exactly the same in size. The mulatto chili is always darker, and the ancho chili is redder. Some places in the world, they will call just this mulatto an ancho negro, like a black ancho, because that's kind of what it is. When they're fresh, both of these are poblano chilies, just different varieties of poblano chilies. Okay, so we've got the mulatto and the ancho chili, and then we've got the other really dark chili. This is the pasilla chili, or sometimes called pasilla negro or pasilla largo, long. So it's either black pasilla or it is called the long pasilla. So you have to know those kinds of things because when you go to the Mexican grocery store or you order online, you're likely going to find some differences in names. If I were you, I would probably order these things online, but if you want the adventure, then go into your Mexican grocery store and talk to them. Say, I'm looking for ancho, mulato, pasilla to make mole. Everybody will know what you're talking about because this is really the star dish in the Mexican kitchen. First step is to clean these guys. So we're going to pull this stem and the seed pod out like that and tear them open. Now I'll let all of the seeds fall out. And then if you want to make it a little less spicy, you pull out the veins. I never do that, but a lot of people will tell you that that's what you should be doing. And then we're going to tell, tear every chili into four pieces like that. Okay, that was five pieces. Okay, I've got my work cut out for me here. Now I'm going to just take a moment to de-seed and stem all of these chilies and get them ready for the next stage of cooking, which will be an, what we call an oil toasting. Okay, so these are the chilies all torn up right now. And I suggest that you make this in a big Dutch oven or a heavy pot. You're going to need something that basically is six to eight quarts, and the heavier, the better. In Mexico, traditional uh, kitchens, it would be an earthenware cazuela. They heat up very, very slowly, but then they hold and distribute the heat incredibly evenly and for a really long time. Now, this looks like a Mexican cazuela, but it's actually enamel-coated cast iron. I'm lucky enough to have a couple of these really cool looking pieces, but any kind of a Dutch oven will, will work. I turned on the heat underneath this uh, right when I started doing the chili so that it could heat up and be uniformly hot. The next thing you have to choose is how you're going to cook these, what you're gonna cook these oil toasted chilies in. It could be a vegetable oil, it could be olive oil, but I think it's a waste of olive oil and it really doesn't give you a flavor that's harmonious with anything in this dish. The opposite end of the spectrum from vegetable oil would be fresh rendered pork lard. And if you want the really traditional flavor, then that's what you could use. And this is what we get from one of our local farmers or you could find it in the Mexican grocery store back near the meat counter 
And um, this is not the stuff that comes in little bricks um, that is hydrogenated. That stuff doesn't have flavor. You want to get fresh rendered pork lard or use vegetable oil. Now, all the way through this, for those of you that are vegetarian or vegan, I'm going to tell you all of the things that you can do to keep this thing on a track that will go all the way to vegan. And it's delicious. So don't think that you're scrimping and, and doing something that's going to turn out a lesser product, okay? So I'm going to put about three tablespoons. I'm going to cook it in the real traditional way with uh, the fresh rendered pork lard. And we're going to need uh, to keep adding fat to this pan as we go through all the different steps. But the first step will be with um, about three tablespoons. I'm not measuring exactly here because I just need enough to coat the bottom of this pot really nicely. Um, we are going to toast these chilies in the fat along with a little bit of onion and garlic. I'm just sort of truncating steps here so that we don't have to do the onion and garlic separately because the truth of the matter is, they'll cook in just about the same amount of time. So I've got the melted lard now. You can hear the crackle sizzle. I've got two cloves of garlic. That was just like a half of a small onion. Um, the garlic's peeled, but it's whole because that's what we really want. Here is to, to retard the time that it's going to, to um, brown. Okay, so now I've got the chilies in on top and I'm gonna use a, a wooden spatula just cause I think it works really well here. And I am literally gonna stand here now for five minutes as these guys toast and the onion and the garlic soften and lightly brown. Now this toasting step is really, really important. And I'm gonna show you what the inside of this looks like. It's a lighter brown color. Remember when we did all of the de-seeding and stemming, it was all dark on the inside. But once they have toasted on the inside, they will have that lighter color. What we're doing here is to develop flavor. Without developing flavor that way, um, the mole is very, one note, okay? I'm gonna take all of these, what we have in here, uh, and put it into the blender jar, directly into the blender jar. You know what I think would help me the most here is a pair of tongs. I was um, quite careful about getting all of the chili seeds out of the, the chilies. Usually I'm not that careful, but I wanna use this pan for the next step. Um, without washing it out because we're going to go into another kind of toasting step. So I just wanted it to not have be covered with all those seeds. I'm turning that down just a little bit. Let's go over to the blender jar, put that on top. I have some chicken stock here, six cups total for this recipe, and I'm gonna put about a cup and a half of it in here. Again, you're not seeing me measure. I just want enough to, go, to help blend these chilies. Uh, so I'm gonna put about a cup and a half in there. We can always add more if we need to when it's blending. If they get stuck going through the blender blades, we're just gonna leave that to soak for a few minutes while we do the next step. Now, the definition of a mole, the way that I think of it, is that it typically is a sauce that really features the, the flavor of chilies. Most people think of it as an ancient recipe, though this particular recipe or the base of this recipe, a mole poblano, has half ingredients that came from outside of Mexico and half indigenous recipes from Mexico. But they're almost always thickened with nuts, seeds, or corn. This one is nuts and seeds. So look what we have here in the second step. We have some almonds and some sesame seeds, and then there's always some sort of a sweet element that naturally is in the mole, and it usually comes from dried fruit. We're going to start off by putting in these almonds into the pan here. So I'm going to first stir these guys for about a minute or two, and then I'm going to add to the pan the little bits of uh, sesame seeds, and you'll see how those start to toast instantly. So these are untoasted sesame seeds. I'm just pulling out 
uh, something that was a little dark there that I don't want to be in the mole. Uh, that could burn, but we're already seeing a little bit of browning going on here with the almonds. Okay, so we got a, you can see it now. There's just enough fat to kind of coat the bottom of the pan nicely. So in will go these raisins. That seems like a weird thing to toast, I know, but what you'll see is that they'll immediately start to uh, kind of puff up and lighten in color. And the same thing will happen when I put in, or not the same thing, but I will, uh, you'll see it starting to toast immediately when I put the sesame seeds in there. And we're just gonna stir this again. You're gonna stir it constantly until everything is toasted beautifully here. Now, we're not going to through that whole toasting, soaking, uh, blending, straining. Well, blending we're going to do for sure, but we're not doing the toasting, soaking. We're doing what I call just a really fast soak directly in the blender jar. That's what's going to save you a lot of time. Now, I'll say when you finish seeing me go through all of these steps, I will tell you that within an hour, you could have a very traditional pot of mole done. And especially for those of you that have looked at traditional recipes for mole poblano, and I've written many of them, um, and you know that it's gonna take you four or five hours to accomplish it, I don't want you to only have mole once in your lifetime. And that's what a lot of you have told me. It's like, oh, I made the mole. That was quite an endeavor. I'm glad I did it once. Well, I'm gonna give you a mole that you could do much more frequently than that. And it will be, I think it will be a back pocket recipe for you because you will love being able to make this. And it's so easy to make in a, in, compared to the traditional ones that you can just make some enchiladas with it. Okay, we'll talk about other things that you could use it on later. But we have to look in here because we are ready to move now. You can see that the little raisins have puffed up and lightened in color. The, we've got a gorgeous golden uh, hue to the sesame seeds and to the, the um, almonds there. And then I'm going to just take these guys. Um, I'm going to move it off over here because I don't want it to toast anymore. And I'm going to scrape this stuff into a bowl. So this, we're going to need to, this for, for cooking down the chilies here in a second. So I'm going to scrape all of this now into this bowl. And then when I finish with that, I'm going to rinse this out and put it back on the fire. Okay, we've got the pan wiped out now, so all the little stray sesame seeds have gotten out of it. I put it back onto the medium to medium high heat at this point. Um, I'm going to film the bottom of it with um, another spoonful of the fresh rendered pork lard that we're working with here. Uh, but you could use oil if that's your choice. Um, and let that melt in there and get ready while we blend these chilies. Now I'm working quickly here and I have a high speed blender. So within a minute or so, I can get these chilies into an absolutely smooth paste. Now, if I was working in just a regular um, standard issue blender, um, I would want to strain this mixture because probably some of those chili skins wouldn't get blended. Um, and it would probably take me two or three minutes to get it really, really um, to the point of being velvety like this. I mean, just look at that. It looks like just like melted chocolate. That's kind of what I always think about with this stuff. But I don't have to strain it. I'm gonna put it into here. You should hear a sizzle when it goes in there, like that. All of it will be scraped out and in here. And we're gonna stir this until it is reduced and thicker and darker in color. That should take another Something like, well, it depends on your, your heat source and again, the size of your pan, but it should take around four or five minutes. 
Now just look at the difference in color that you see here. You also notice that it's really shiny. That's real critical. But most important is the thickness of it. Basically what we're trying to do here is to sear the flavors and we're gonna mellow the flavors of the chili. And we're in all of this cooking down the whole thing starts to pull together as one of the most beautiful flavors that you could imagine. Too little cooking at this stage means you're gonna have a harsh mole. So don't skimp in this stage at all. Okay, so I'm finished with that. We're gonna go on to the blending of the second batch of ingredients that go in here. I'm just gonna actually turn this off right now and come back to it. I don't wash the blender for this because it's just got stuff that's already in the pot. Um, I'm gonna scrape in here this mixture of the sesame, almonds, and toasted raisins. And then we'll talk about the other ingredients that are gonna go in here. So we have on this last tray in front of us here, um, some, uh, some tomatoes. Usually in a traditional recipe, they would ask you to roast some tomatoes. Um, this is fire roasted tomatoes in a can. It's about three, two thirds of a 15 ounce can, about a cup of tomatoes. And then those are gonna go in here. Couple slices of bread. This is one of the other thickeners that is very common in a, a classic mole, like a mole poblano. Some people would also put a toasted tortilla in here. So you could swap out a couple tortillas for one of those pieces of bread if you wanted to. And now we're on to the spices, which really is what makes this mole quite unique uh, or makes mole unique. And it's black pepper, cinnamon stick, cloves, a bunch of stuff that's sort of tasting like it's baking spices in here, and then anise seed. And I'm gonna crush those in the Mexican uh, molcajete here. Um, and I'm not gonna use all of this cinnamon stick, just a piece of the cinnamon stick. Now this is true cinnamon, so it doesn't, it's not the cassia bark we usually call cinnamon. Um, and it just breaks very easily in your hand. And it's got a really lovely flowery, uh, aroma to it. The black peppercorns, it might seem like that this isn't enough spices for such a big pot of mole. It's a, by mole standards, it's a small pot of mole, but it's, they're never overwhelmed by any of these spices. So I'm gonna crush it rock against rock until I get everything into an absolute powder. Okay. I'm just about there and I tell you, when you make this mole, you are going to be in heaven right now. The smell of the cooked down chilies and these fresh ground spices. Of course, if you don't have a mortar to work with, then you're gonna probably use some pre-ground spices. But if you do have a mortar, take the time to grind them fresh. And then they're gonna go right into the blender jar. We've got some Mexican chocolate. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. On to the blender base now. This is all going to go. And I'm gonna add another, about a cup and a half, just enough to get all this mixture to go through the blender blades. Put the top back on here and blend. Now with a Vitamix blender, that has taken me about a minute and a half. Most blenders would take three or four minutes to do it, but let me show you what you're looking for here. Uh, when you take a little bit of this mixture and you rub it between your fingers, you should feel no sesame seeds left. And so this has got just the tiniest little bit of grit. If you're not working with a high speed blender, I highly recommend that you pass it through a, a strainer, just a regular strainer, nothing fancy, not like a chinois or anything like that, but just what I would call a medium mesh strainer. Uh, with this, I'm just gonna take the opportunity right now to put this back on the heat and about, again, about a medium high heat. Scrape all of this in here, and then I'm gonna stir it again. This is a lot of stirring, I understand, but it's gonna stir it again for about five minutes or so until it's reduced again to about the consistency of tomato paste. Now, 
Uh, we're back to looking like melted chocolate here. If your mixture is really well blended, that's actually what you should be seeing here. I know this is a lot of stirring, but I will tell you that it is what makes this thing come together in flavor. Um, I brought this uh, spatter screen out to show you. Some of you may want to do this spatter screen over just to catch any little flying things. But if you're stirring it pretty vigorously through the whole thing, there should be minimal uh, spattering with this thing. So, okay, now the last thing that we're gonna do here is to add the rest of our broth to this. You, well, let's just look, come on in and look at it because you gotta see what the consistency of it. I said it's as thick as tomato paste again, and um, it's very shiny. Uh, that's all the fat that's in here starting to separate out. Fat that comes not only from the oil or lard that you're cooking this in, but also from the sesame seeds and the almonds. So I'm gonna put the rest of our broth in here. The whole thing is going to take about six cups and you're going to end up here with some place over two quarts of mole. If that sounds like a lot to you, just let me tell you that most recipes for mole making, because it's always made for a big fiesta, would make many gallons of mole and it would take two or three days of procuring the ingredients, doing the prep for the ingredients and um, doing all of the cooking. And then, of course, mole is typically allowed to simmer for quite a long time and often served the day after because just like with any great stew, flavors develop and you can taste more nuance of things when you have it the following day. B freezes beautifully, so any leftovers can go into the freezer. What you'll want to do after you've defrosted it is to put it back in the blender and just reblend and it'll just come right back together. So it's a very, very useful thing to have in your repertoire because within an hour or so of now and I do tell you you do need to have all your ingredients out don't be running and looking for things during the preparations always make sure that you measure out all of your ingredients and have them on the countertop to get this to go well because it's a lot of stirring and cooking so you're really busy through this whole thing I would say leave this on to simmer a minimum of an hour long longer if you can, preferably two, three, four hours. Put it over a medium low heat. And then this is one that um, I made yesterday and I refrigerated it overnight because we have to talk about seasonings here. You'll notice a little bit of oil separating out on the top. You can just bale that off with a ladle if you want to or stir it back in. The richness on your palate of a good mole comes from having the right amount of fat in, in it. So I just like to stir it back in. You could use a whisk or a spoon to do that. Um, so if it has gotten thicker, then say, I, I would say like a cream soup consistency. Some people like their moles thicker than that. I like them sort of cream soup consistency, but this one's thickened up just a little bit. So I'm just gonna thin it with just a little bit of water or you could use some stock now. As I was telling you before, you can make a perfectly delicious vegan mole just using water or, or uh, vegetable broth through the whole cooking. I actually like water in this because I think it allows all of that complexity of the chilies, the onions and the garlic, the tomatoes, all those spices, the bread thickening, all of that stuff goes together to create one unique mole flavor. And I like to highlight that a lot of times. So to tell you the truth, lots of times I make it with water because I think that would work. Then you can serve it to your vegan friends and your meat eating friends. Just think about having a grilled chicken breast uh, with this mole on it or putting it in some enchiladas um, that have some roasted vegetables in it. Or maybe you've just grilled some eggplant and you spoon this over the top of it. Oh my gosh, it would be like one of the most glorious meals of your life but we have to get the seasonings right. And this is where a lot of people stumble. They don't know how to season it. There are two seasonings that go into it, salt and sugar, and you cannot leave either one of them out. It's very essential that you season it first, I say first with salt. And remember, we've got like two and a half quarts of mole here. 
So it's going to take a fair amount of salt just to get it started here. So I'm going to start with that part of it. I've seasoned a lot of pots of mole in my life. And so it's, I know kind of where to start, but um, in the recipe that will accompany this video, I will let you, um, I will give you the ideas as to how much to start with. Now that's not going to make the flavors all unified. I have to get the sugar in there to do that. But I first start with this, the salt flavor and, and I think I hit it almost exactly right. Remember if you're working with uh, salted chicken broth or salted vegetable stock, um, you're going to have to be careful because you will already have a dose of salt in this during the, the simmering period. Okay, so I think I hit it right. And now I'm going to put in some sugar. Now this will probably take more than what you think and you're not ruining the sauce by putting sugar in it. What you're doing is bringing out the elements, the fruity elements of the dried chilies. Remember, Dried chilies are a dried fruit, and you are wanting to bring that forward by the addition of the sugar here. For those of you that um, think sugar is evil, yes, you could possibly use something like agave syrup or one of the other kinds of sweeteners that you like to use, but you have to add a sweet element. Mole should be slightly sweet, and richly salty. Both of those things sort of on a tightrope back and forth. I'm getting really happy now because to me, this is one of the most glorious dishes in the entire world. And to be able to create it, to be able to continue this tradition of making mole um, and who knows how it all came together over many, many centuries but it's something that deserves to be made time and time again and shared all over the world because really this is the crowning glory of Mexican food. You might wanna use it in different ways than what they would traditionally be used in Mexico over some poached chicken or some turkey perhaps. Um, I love this mole on grilled swordfish. So think about things that a rich sauce like this could enhance, but it's a robust sauce. I love it on pork. Pork is absolutely delicious. If you grill a really beautiful ribeye steak, this can be absolutely wonderful on it. So you can think outside the box at the same time you're respecting the tradition of making a really world-class mole in, in just an hour flat, basically. So get in the kitchen, have this experience, fall in love with what is a very traditional flavor that's been, been developed by cooks over centuries and centuries. Have fun cooking. Chocolate, I forgot to talk about chocolate. We didn't ever add the chocolate to this pot. When you add the last edition of the broth, you put chopped Mexican chocolate in here. A lot of you would know that as sort of Abuelita uh, brand or one of the Ibarra brands or something like that. Um, there are a lot of different brands of Mexican chocolate, but you have to think of it as a seasoning that goes in here. This has not become a chocolate sauce, even though it is seasoned with just a little bit of chocolate. But in its natural state, of course, chocolate is bitter and it makes this sauce so beautifully complex, but never enough of it in there that it's gonna make it taste chocolatey. Just complex. Mm -hmm.